this on? Doesn't seem like it. Oh, now it is. Okay. Welcome everyone again to today's first uh, session. I'm, I'm really excited to be here to moderate uh, what I consider uh, you know, the best possible panel members uh, on the subject of infrastructure governance. Uh, we've, we've already heard uh, three different speeches on the subject and I hope to have uh, a lively set of discussions on the issue of, uh, of how to deliver quality infrastructure better uh, that is more sustainable, impactful, and equitable. I think that's our agenda today. Um, and let me uh, start off by introducing uh, each of the uh, distinguished uh, panel members. Um, and uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Uh, Saw so Tech One. He is the executive. Uh, can we give a round of applause? He is the Executive Vice President of KIND uh, managing and Managing Director of the Strategy and Planning Division. Uh, previously, he served as CEO of JSC, uh, Nescra Hydro in the Republic of Georgia, which was a project company of K Water. He was also previously CEO of Angat Hydropower Corporation in Philippines and also CFO of Star Hydropower Limited in Pakistan. So obviously, he has a strong track record of actual experience managing PPP projects in uh, developing countries. Let me uh, next uh, introduce uh, uh, Martin Rama. He uh, already gave uh, one of the opening speeches. Uh, he's the senior economic advisor for the World Bank uh, in the South uh, Asia practice. From 2013 to 2018, Martin was the chief economist in the World Bank for the South Asia region as well, and he was the director of the World Bank Development Report, the 2013 World Bank Development Report. Before that, he was the lead economist for uh, Vietnam. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce the Morag Baer, Director, Leading Practices, Global Infrastructure Hub. She, um, she uh, joined as a secondi from uh, DFID, uh, the UK Department of International Development. She's a senior infrastructure advisor with over 25 years of experience working in, on infrastructure issues, uh, particularly in developing countries. She worked on countries such as Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, Bangladesh, and uh, Central Asia. Before um, joining GIH, she also worked at the European uh, Investment Bank focusing on Africa, uh, on, again, on infrastructure projects and related issues. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Diwakar Gupta, Vice President, uh, ADB, Private Sector and PPP. Um, I was joking with him that he's already offered all the possible solutions to uh, <laughs> today's discussion and his opening remarks. Um, he is the Vice President for Private Sector Operations and PPPs, Public-Private Partnerships at ADB, uh, which he assumed uh, this position in August 2015. He oversees ADB's uh, private sector projects uh, on uh, developing countries, and he's responsible for building and maintaining ADB's uh, PPP operations. Um, next, I would like to introduce Mr. Edwin Lau, Head of Budgeting and Public uh, Expenditure, OECD. Edwin is the Head of OECD Division for Budgeting and Public um, Expenditure, which is a lead contrib uh, contributor to the OECD infrastructure project through its work on infrastructure governance, PPPs and capital budgeting, uh, balance sheet management, performance and value for money management. He formerly led OECD work on digital government, public sector innovation indicators and risk management. That to me is quite interesting because one of the things we could uh, discuss among many issues is the use of technological innovation in infrastructure. Uh, so maybe Edwin can say a little bit about that later. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Mr. Arash Alawi. He is the <clears throat> he is the managing director of uh, Macquarie Capital in Hong Kong. <clears throat> He's been at the firm for over 14 years and has worked on Australia, the Middle East, Asia, focusing on infrastructure and renewable energy. He led transactions in various sectors, including food waste management, waste to water district cooling, wastewater, and PPPs. He is responsible for initiatives in fuel cell and solar sector ways, where he is leading the development 
of over 300 megawatts of uh, projects. So as, as, uh, as you can see, we have a very, uh, very good panel members across a wide spectrum of experience, and I, I hope to have uh, a, a lively discussion and Q&A session as well. What, what we propose to do is, if each panel member can briefly, uh, maximum five minutes, talk a little bit about uh, various issues uh, related to infrastructure governance, can I propose that we start off by, we ask uh, Mr. Uh, Taekwon So uh, from KIND. Um, oh, wait a second, sorry. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hoon. Sorry, so uh, let, me, let me backtrack here. We're gonna, yes, yeah, we'll start with uh, Mr. Taekwon So to, and we'll ask him to talk about uh, from the perspective of an investor in Project Manor, maybe he can talk a little bit about his actual experience in working in uh, countries like Georgia. You know, what are the challenges? What went right? Uh, what, uh, what were some of the difficulties as a, as a uh, project manager that he experienced that he can share with us to think about how to improve infrastructure governance and, uh, again, delivering uh, quality and in infrastructure sustainably and equitably. So, Mr. So? Yes. Thanks for giving me this first opportunity to remark. If you allow me, I will speak in Korean. I have worked project in the field and I have worked in 에 대한 어떤 이제 실무자로서 느꼈던 어려움 또 개선 방안을 좀 말씀드리고 싶고요. 제가 말씀드리는 것에 대해서 여기 있는 계시는 분들이 동의하시는 부분도 있을 거고 동의 못 하시는 부분도 있을 텐데 일단 제 경험을 솔직하게 말씀드려 보겠습니다. 제가 이 이번에 가버넌스 포럼을 하면서 이 가버넌스라는 게 뭔지에 대해서 이제 처음 접해 봤습니다. 굉장히 이해하기 어려웠던 용어였는데 어 공부를 하면서 이제 느꼈던 게이 가버넌스라는 게 프로젝트의 어떤 셀렉션부터 실행 또 나중에 사후 피드백까지 여러 이해관계자가 그 과정에 개입해서 어떤 의사결정을 이루어 나가는 어떤 과정이라고 이해를 했습니다. 근데 이제 어떤 개발 도상국에서 프로젝트를 실행할 때 이제 그 투자자가 느끼는 랜더가 아닌 투자자가 느끼는 가장 큰 어려움은 사실 이제 MDB에서 가지고 있는 또는 실행해야 되는 ENS 세이프가드 이슈가 가장 큰 이제 어려움이었습니다. 왜냐하면 그 개발 도상국은 이런 그 대주단 MDB가 가지고 있는 ENS 스탠다드에 근접하는 어떤 레귤레이션 환경 관련 레귤레이션 어떤 사회적 약자에 대한 레귤레이션 이런 것들이 완벽히 갖춰지지 않고 또한 거기에 어떤 건설 부서와 또 환경 부서 간에 어떤 규제 법이 서로 또 잘 맞지 않는 매치가 되지 않는 이제 그런 부분들이 있습니다. 그러니까 투자자 입장에서는 그 나라 법을 준수를 해야 되는 어떤 그 사항이 일단 첫 번째가 되어 있는데 대주단의 파이낸싱을 받기 위해서는 MDB ENS 스탠다드를 또 충족시켜야 되는 하지만 그 현지의 법과 MDB ENS 세이프가드 사이에는 많은 어떤 이제 디스크레펀시 어떤 불일치가 또 있고 또한 그레이 에어리어가 상당히 많습니다. 결국 뭐 제가 경험을 말씀드리면 이제 그큰 어떤 발전소를 짓는데 거기에 이제 두 가구, 투 하우스홀드를 이제 그 건설 기간 동안에만 이주를 시켜야 되는 왜냐하면 건설 기간 혹시 이제 그 주민들이 다칠 수도 있고 건강에 위협도 될수 있고 그래서 건설 기간 동안 이주를 시켜야 되는데 결국 어떤 이제 대주단의 어떤 ENS 세이프 가드에 따르면 어떤 비자발적인 이주는 또 허용이 안 되고 그래서 이제 그두 가구를 그대로 위치를 시키면서 사이트를 위치시키면서 설계 변경을 해야 되고 그러다 보면 또그 시공사 입장에서는 그두 가구를 바이패스해서 가야 되고 또 설계 변경되면서 코스트가 또 변동이 되고 코스트가 변경되면서 파이낸싱에 또 영향을 미치게 되고 이제 여러 가지 어떤 그 체인 리액션, 연쇄 반응이 이제 일어나게 됩니다. 그러면 
이 투자자 입장에서는 처음에 자기가 어떤 상정했던 프로젝트 가정들이 또 허물어지고 그것을 다시 큐어하는 시간이 또 필요하게 되고 이제 그런 것들이 이제 계속 어떤 프로젝트의 딜레이 또 코스트 임팩트를 가져오는 그런 이제 실제 어려움이 있거든요. 그리고 또한 그 시공사 입장에서도 어떤 합리적인 어떤 그 ENS 세이프카드 대책을 이제 내놨는데 현지 주민들은 또 그거에 만족하지 않고 더 많은 걸 이제 요구를 하게 되고 특히 제가 또 아까 뭐 부총리님께서 렌즈 에퀴지션 이슈를 이야기하셨는데 제가 이제 토지 렌즈 에퀴지션을 두 국가에서 해봤습니다. 근데 이제 어려운 점은 거기 그 현재 계신 주민들이 기꺼이 이주할 수 있을 만큼 충분한 이제 보상을 주고서 이제 이주를 시키고 싶은데 또 현지 정부에서는 만약에 너희 프로젝트에서 그 정도의 보상을 해준다면 다음 프로젝트의 투자자는 또더 많은 또 렌즈 에퀴지션 코스트가 발생하게 되고 그 주민들을 스포일하게 된 그래서 결국은 향후에 인프라 개발을 못한다. 이제 이런 그 현지 정부의 어떤 반대도 굉장히 심하고 이제 그런 것에 대해서 투자자는 대주단과 현지 정부 사이에서 굉장히 또 스톡되고 힘든 상황이 발생을 하게 되는 이제 그런 걸 제가 경험을 했습니다. 그래서 제가 어 이번에 이제 가버넌스 포럼에서 만약에 나중에 다룰 주제가 있다면 이런 그 대주단의 ENS 스탠다드를 그 나라의 수준에 맞게 좀 어, 맞춰주고 또그 나라의 ENS 스탠다드를 MDB 수준에 또 끌어올려주고 이런 과정을 같이 이렇게 밟아 나가야지 어떤 <웃음> 처음부터 MDB 스탠다드를 개발도상국에 적용을 해버리면 그 나라는 계속 인프라 갭이 벌어질 수밖에 없는 그런 상황이 발생을 하게 될것 같아서 그걸 좀 제가 말씀드리고 싶고요. 그다음에 그 금융적인 또 측면에서 보면은. 지금 사실 이제 그 개발도상국에서 저희가 인프라 시설을 건설을 하는데 건설 코스트가 계속 이제 올라가게 됩니다. 왜냐하면 MDB에서는 이제 퀄리티 있는 인프라 또 세이프하고 굉장히 지속 가능한 인프라를 요구하기 때문에 설계가 계속 강화가 될 수밖에 없거든요. 그래서 결국 이게 이제 코스트가 이제 계속 올라가게 되는데 그 코스트를 투자자 입장에서 회수하기 위해서는 테립 뭐, 뭐 서비스 피가 되겠죠. 서비스 피를 그 투자된 자금을 회수할 수 있을 만큼 충분하게 받아야 됩니다. 하지만 그 개발도상국에 있는 그 인프라 이용자들은 그를 지불할 만한 어떤 소득이 없고 결국은 그게 이제 투자자를 계속 이제 좌절을 시키게 되고 현지 주민들은 그 인프라의 서비스 피에 대해서 계속 어떤 불만을 갖는 그러한 상황이 발생하고 있습니다. 그래서 어 제가 이제 마지막으로 좀 처음에 마지막으로 했던 프로젝트가 그 솔로몬 티나 그 수력 프로젝트 그제 프로젝트를 받았었는데 결국 그런 것처럼 어떤 그 금융 쪽에서도 어떤 융합 또는 복합 즉어 어떤 프라이빗 파이낸스로 그 충분한 어떤 이제 서비스 테리블 어포더블하게 제공할 수 없다면 컨세셔널 론도 MDB에서 고려를 해주시고 또 컨세셔널 론으로도 안 된다면 그란트로도 해서 그 개발도상국 그 이용자들이 자기들이 감당 가능한 지불 가능한 수준에서 인프라 서비스를 이용할 수 있도록 그래서 그 인프라가 어떤 캐피탈로 축적이 되고 난 후에 그 자체적으로 이제 서스테이너블하게 그 나라가 운영될 수 있도록 그런 차원에서 MDB에서 접근해 주시고 가버넌스도 좀 그런 ENS 세이프가드를 어떻게 좀 현실적으로 만들 건지 또 금융을 어떻게 또 현지 정부가 이용 가능하게 만들 건지에 대해서 좀더 고민해 주시면 하는 게제 의견입니다. 예, 이상입니다. Thank you. So if I may briefly summarize, I think what you're saying is are we sufficiently taking into account local conditions? I think that's what it really boils down to. You, issue, you raise issues about safeguards, how uh, safeguard standards from uh, international uh, development financial institutions are quite high and difficult to meet in the project context in a local environment which doesn't have the uh, necessary standards and regulations. You talked about the high cost of resettlement cost and also uh, you know, the need to balance the request or the, the need for 
high quality versus the high cost that, uh, that would come with that. So I think you raised very good points, I think, from your actual experience on the ground. So um, let me move on to the, the next set of panel members. I'd like to ask first Martin and then Edwin, based on your uh, experience, to talk about maybe a, uh, the broader sort of policy and regulatory issues about improving infrastructure governance and you know mobilizing private financing for infrastructure and the sort of the broader infrastructure governance issues. Uh, can I ask Martin to start first? Sure, thank you, Hun. Uh, sometimes I think when, when it comes to financing infrastructure, we get carried away in the innovative solutions that can be worked out to get the private participants. But uh, what I would like to do is to take one step back and to look at the key economic challenges we face. Because whatever instrument we use uh, will not be successful if it doesn't address these challenges. And I want to, to really highlight two of them. And let me, to simplify, call one of them externalities and the other one risks. On the externality side, um, Infrastructure is transformation, or at least can be transformation. When a highway is built, when an airport is built, uh, when uh, electricity is provided to areas, uh, you get a transformation. You get spatial transformation, you get structural transformation, and in a way you get a lot of things going that go beyond the infrastructure you build. It is not just what happens on the railway or on the highway, it's what happens around it. It's the job creation, it's the urbanization, it's the change in labor force participation. And that's what I mean by externality. Like the most important infrastructure, the, 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 the big things, the, the infrastructure gap we are talking about, has impacts that go way beyond uh, the, the infrastructure itself. And, and many of these impacts translate essentially into increase in land value where the infrastructure is. The, the, the increase in land value reflects how much more output can be generated on the same land now as it urbanizes, as jobs are created. But that poses a very important challenge to finance infrastructure because if, if the overall return is bigger than what happens on the trunk infrastructure itself, uh, then it's difficult to cover it just on the proceeds that an operator uh, can get. So the more transformational the infrastructure, the bigger the viability gap that you face. Uh, and the problem I would like to highlight here when it comes to policy is that uh, appropriating in some way some that in, of that increasing in land value is what will make infrastructure affordable. We can be very creative on the financing mechanism, but it's that increasing land value, and I will say management of land and, and taxation related to land uh, or, or the value that is generated on, on the land is one of the weakest parts uh, in many developing countries. We don't have good cadastral records, we don't have good property valuation, we have insecure uh, property titles. And that has been the case uh, in, as countries develop everywhere. If you think of the railways in the US, they were partly financed by the big investors buying land where the railways will be and appropriating themselves the value of the land around it. Or closer to here, where we are now in Korea, if you think of how the Japanese railways have operated, the Japanese railways, railways companies are developers uh, around the land. So I would say a, a first big challenge is we get carried away with uh, the the technical design of the private participation, but we have a broader policy environment in which if we do not find right ways to appropriate uh, land value, to capture uh, that increasing land value, we will be facing a gap that is huge. If we only say, okay, the private sector will do this because it's profitable, the profitable part will be a smaller share, the more transformational the project. The second concept is risk, so that was externality. The second concept which I think is very important for us is risk. Any involvement of the private sector amounts to splitting the risk between the public sector and the private sector, which part is taken by each. And ideally we would like to have the commercial risk 
with the private operator, the institutional risk with the government. That will be the ideal split. And conceptually, we all understand it. But again, the problem we face is that uh, the capacity in many developing countries for the government to manage that institutional risk is limited. Ideally, you will say the operator takes on the risk of whether there will be more traffic, less traffic, more projections. The government takes on the risk of land clearance, resettlement, of the, all these things that the private operator cannot do efficiently. And in principle, you can sign on, yes, yes, we will do the land clearance. And then the problems that were highlighted uh, in the examples in Georgia and other countries arise. Because again, we don't have good mechanisms for compensation, we, don't, we have uncertain titling, uh, we have politics coming into the process and not just uh, legal issues. Uh, we have international organizations like ours that have different standards of resettlement and compensation and safeguards as opposed to uh, local governments, which add some complexity. So from a policy perspective, what I would say is it is great to work on the financing part, and I'm sure we will get a lot of interesting ideas here, <coughs> but for governments, things are related to land taxation, land value capture, the fairness and clarity of land acquisition and resettlement will be essential uh, beyond the funding for infrastructure to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So uh, I, I like the fact that you raised very specific issues and suggestions. You focused on the need for having better compensation uh, mechanisms and allocation of risk in particular uh, regarding issues of land valuation and extracting you know, government revenues from that through taxation and the challenges of doing that in, in uh, developing country context with also land acquisition and resettlement. Um, let me also now ask Edwin to also talk about um, the sort of the broader infrastructure governance issues, regulations and policies and, uh, and related issues. Edwin? Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm going to buck the trend and have a slide, but just one. So I'll keep it <laughs> very simple. Um, I'm actually very glad that the session is called Getting Infrastructure Right. It actually aligns very well with the OECD framework on governance infrastructure. And this has been a bit of a template, I think, for work done by the World Bank, also by the ADB and other international actors to think about what it means by infrastructure governance. And I think that is important as well, because this is not something just for governments. Part of the work that I'm doing is working with other actors. Infrastructure is not just for the infrastructure community. It's too important for that. Uh, getting ministries of finance, getting the private sector involved, and understanding that getting the governance right is important both for government decision making, but also to inform the investor community. And actually about a month and a half ago, we had the OECD Infrastructure Forum, and Tom Barrett, who will be speaking later in the afternoon, was chairing that session, and we talked a bit about what we mean by infrastructure governance. So um, I'm just going to go across the four uh, boxes on the bottom because we have 10 dimensions of infrastructure governance, and I don't have the time to go into all of them, but just to give you some examples of what those mean. And Vice President Gupta, I think, sp spoke very well about the first dimension uh, in his opening remarks about the need for strategic vision and planning. And of course, who can be against strategic vision and planning? Every everyone feels that that's a very important thing. But in the real world, we know that there are many forces that act against that. So about half of OECD countries actually have an infrastructure uh, vision in place, which allows them to talk about the trade-offs that are necessary. But in the other half of OECD countries, those plans exist only at the sector level. So how do you make the trade-offs necessary to think about uh, whether or not, with limited funding, uh, where you should target your, your scarce resources? To give you an example, following the uh, global crisis, uh, public investment spending in Spain dropped from about six billion a year, no, from about 22 billion a year to six billion a year. So suddenly, the money dried up and they had to make the tough decisions. So what is the basis, what is the strategic document that's going to allow you to link all of these demands arising from the bottom up in each sector to what the government can afford uh, and, and sustain? Um, the OECD did a review of infrastructure investment in Chile and we found that the changing nature of infrastructure demands is also requiring a greater role of strategic planning for, by the government. So in Chile, for example, uh, following a period of rapid growth of a lot of kind of hard infrastructure, roads and uh, energy grid, they're now moving into a greater demand for social infrastructure, 
schools, hospitals. And there, the market mechanisms do not always work quite as well. And so the, the need for the government to be quite uh, clear about both what its objectives are and to link those to indicators uh, meant that it was needing to draw on a new level of uh, capacity within government that it didn't have up to that point in time. Um, in terms of the enabling framework, uh, some of the estimates by cost or by McKinsey show that up to 30 or 40 percent of uh, infrastructure investment can be lost due to poor governance, uh, whether that's through inefficiencies or through corruption. And so putting in place uh, the, the structures that allow you to deal not just with corruption, but also aligning the incentives for efficient investment are quite important. Now, about half of OECD countries have some type of uh, a mandatory framework to review uh, um, uh, infrastructure investment decision making. But in fact, it's also bringing in other actors into that process, which is quite important. So the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency and Public Credit Mexico uh, worked to, to develop, a, I think it's called Infrastructure in the Street, I believe is the name of the, the, the initiative, where they make uh, infrastructure plans available, geotagged, so that citizens can actually go and confirm whether or not the information that the government is providing them is real. So the people who are being affected by those infrastructure uh, projects, they can go and say, this is where, what you said you were going to do, this is what we see. They can take pictures, they can post it online. You were asking a bit about what some of these, these technology tools are. The top-down types of controls really have limited uh, 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 value when you can really crowdsource the ability to both hold government accountable, but also to provide information on impacts that otherwise government may not be able to know. Infrastructure is vast, government is small, and so we need to be able to bring all the actors to enable all the actors to bear uh, on that decision making and monitoring. The third area around affordability, financing, and value for money, uh, the majority of OECD countries use some type of value for money assessment. There are many different types of methodologies that they can use, but if you ask them what else plays into their infrastructure decision making process, it's one word, politics. And so, of course, we will never remove that from the decision-making process, but being able to have greater transparency and clarity about the methodologies is going to improve the, the legitimacy of those decisions and perhaps put decision-makers a bit more, constrained is perhaps not the right word, but to, to make them more accountable in, in making sure that the, the decisions are the right ones. So I had given the, uh, the example of Spain earlier, the ERAF, which is the uh, independent fiscal institution uh, <coughs> of Spain, asked the OECD to work with them to help uh, develop a methodology for comparing uh, infrastructure investments across modalities. So in the post-crisis period, a lot of infrastructure investment for transport in particular was really based on economic development and regional inequalities. And of course, you know, those are quite good motivations, but there was real, no real cost-benefit analysis, especially comparing different modalities of transport. Should we invest more in interregional transport? Should we invest more in urban transport? Should we invest more in ferries to remote islands? These are very different types of investments, and yet when you have a constrained uh, 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 public purse, you need to be able to think about that. And so we're working with them now to try to, to develop methodologies that they can present to the government and use that as a basis for the justification of some of the upcoming uh, infrastructure investment decisions. And then finally, with regard to the life cycle perspective, this is really thinking about the entire uh, uh, cycle of infrastructure investment from the planning to the, the choice of instruments to the monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and so in, what this means is it's not just about what is the initial upfront investment, but are we thinking about what the full operational costs are? And also in some cases like uh, nuclear, are we thinking about what the decommissioning of those nuclear plants will be? So in order for us to have quality infrastructure, we have to think about that entire life cycle cost. Uh, part of that is really about infrastructure, and the World Bank and the OECD um, announced just on Monday a report on the impact of uh, um, disasters on fiscal resilience. And so what this is telling us is that if you don't think about the resiliency of your infrastructure, that the costs in the long run can be much higher than um, that any savings you might have gotten by cutting corners. So over the last 10 years, over 1.2 trillion was lost 
due to uh, an infrastructure investment due to uh, natural disasters. And so making sure that all of those costs are considered ex ante as part of the investment uh, 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 calculation is critical if you want to have long-term sustainable infrastructure. Great, thank you. Um, a very nice uh, and uh, succinct summary of the OECD framework for infrastructure governance. Uh, some of the things that I picked up, um, acknowledgement that politics will always play a role in infrastructure decision making. So how do we balance that to make sure you make the right decisions based on cost, uh, right analysis of the cost benefit analysis, value for money, and also uh, having a life cycle perspective, uh, which would then take into account issues like resilience to disasters and what sort of cost implications there are to that. Acknowledgement that everybody, uh, of course, uh, supports the need for an overall infrastructure strategy, but it's not always so easy given conflicting demands. Um, and uh, I especially like your point about the need to use technology for bottom-up participation and mobility uh, monitoring. <clears throat> Okay, so let's now move on to the next two set of speakers. I would like to propose first uh, Morag and then Diwakar to reflect on, from their experience working in public uh, development finance institutions, to what extent these sort of public institutions and facilities can contribute to unlocking greater private investments and lowering transaction costs. Can I first ask uh, Morag to start? Okay, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Infrastructure is very much sits at the heart of economic, environmental, and social dimensions. So I think it's important to go back first to what are the mandate of these different institutions. And I'll use the term DFIs very broadly. I mean, DFIs have to work in alignment with their development mandate, be that poverty, poverty reduction, climate mitigation, other policy objectives. Um, the private sector, of course, needs a risk-adjusted return. And the broader public sector, the governments, they're seeking GDP growth, employment, and other social on outcomes. And today, it's not just GDP growth, not just economic growth, but inclusive in, in, um, economic growth. Um, basically recognizing that inequalities, um, they limit the sustainability of growth. So this strategic alignment of the different institutions is really important. So that's the first place to start. And once we're confident on that strategic alignment, you know, only then we have the social license to go forward and to talk about de-risking, how to optimize value for money and outcomes. The private sector will desire predictable enabling environment, reducing their uncertainties. Um, they'll need the right projects where there's a real need um, that will ensure the sustainability of revenues. Well-prepared projects that reduce risks further down the line and efficient transactions and effective implementation. I'll, I'll touch on each of these and on what the DFIs can do um, in turn. On the enabling environment, um, we have a tool called InfoCompass that's basically looked at all the indicators associated with infrastructure and to see which came out as being aligned um, with better flow and quality of infrastructure. And the two indicators which came out on top were basically rule of law and control of corruption. So this also points back to the importance of these upstream governance issues um, which do go broader than infrastructure alone. On the enabling environment, I think a lot of DFIs have worked success successfully here. Um, the Royal Bank PF is one that particularly comes to mind. But from my experience, to be successful, you really have to have a, a good government champion. It's not something that DFIs can do alone. They can support this process. Um, similarly, when it comes to selecting the right projects, again, this goes back to having that strategic vision and long-term plan um, that can sort of withstand partisan politics and such like. Um, there are really good examples of where DFIs, um, and MDBs and others have, have played a role there. Um, the West Africa Power Pool is one that comes to my mind. Um, there was an update in 2008 supported um, 
by the EU Africa Infrastructure Trust Fund. And from that became a lot of other projects. Um, a number of them are now under implementation. But you know, what worked there is you had a strong government lead and you had a lot of coordination between the different <coughs> DBs. On project preparation, MDBs are a key um, supporter um, of project preparation facilities. Project preparation costs have been cited to be between 5% and 10% of investment needs. This is obviously a large number. It's not just the finance, but also the capacity building, which is important. Um, and governments should take like that as, as a stepping stone to building local capacity um, for project preparation. And I think, indeed, there needs to be particularly a focus on the early stage um, project preparation. Um, what I've noticed working within a blending facility, when it gets to the later stage, um, then I think the various DFIs are more on home turf um, and can do that extremely well. Then the role of the DFIs in supporting transactions and reducing transport, tra um, transaction costs. Um, one of the things that can be done is, is supporting greater consistency of approaches, um, looking at issues relating to risk allocation, um, contractual provisions, and here both the Global Infrastructure and the World Bank have, have done a lot of work. Also looking at consistency perhaps in key performance indicators, etc. Um, and where there is more comparability and a move from a project based to more of a program based <coughs> approach, as in the South African Renewable Energy um, PPP program, um, you can uh, simplify the due diligence required and, and reduce the costs. And then, of course, one of the aspects that's important um, for private investment is the um, financial viability gap. As mentioned earlier by the panel, not all projects will be commercially viable alone. Um, there will be external externalities. Some of these can maybe be captured um, in terms of increased sort of land prices, etc. Some of them will also be in things like increased health benefits from water and sanitation projects. Um, so, you know, with proper examination, this puts the case for public subsidy. Public subsidy can be applied in a number of ways, um, and that should align with the objectives. Uh, it will be project specific. Um, one of the ways is the subsidy of capital investment up front. Um, simple, quite often effective, perhaps not so targeted as other, as other means. Um, reducing early stage risks. Um, such as the renewable um, risk mitigation facility, um, demand guarantees where there are uncertainties that the private sector aren't able to control, first loss approaches, fund of funds. Um, also, local currency finance, I think, is an interesting area to look at. Um, we've done recent work on national infrastructure banks and their role uh, in raising um, local currency finance that could reduce um, exchange rate risks. Um, and finally, it's important that the DFI approaches adapt to suit the context. You know, in some developing and emerging contexts, they will have that in demonstration role, reducing perceived risks by being the first able to take the risk of going in there and showing that something works then they'll have a role um, in moving from a project approach to a more systematic program approach. Um, and finally, it's important to consider also the maturity and the point of which to exit. Again, when we've been looking at the national infrastructure banks, this is one of the areas which came out. KFW, you know, it started rebuilding um, infrastructure after the war in Europe. You know, a lot of that initial um, approaches no longer required. They have then adopted to focus more on green finance and, you know, the approach has evolved and at some stage, you know, the work can be done um, and then it's, it's retargeted. Um, so all of these, the real focus is on, on quality infrastructure, quality infrastructure which brings together resilience, environmental, social, economic and financial considerations.
Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to quickly summarize, um, it's, it's good to hear that DFIs do have an important role, it seems, <laughs> in uh, helping and promoting and you know, building local capacity, supporting project preparation, uh, reducing transaction costs, uh, doing the demonstration projects to show to other investors that it is possible to have good projects in, in sometimes difficult context. But you also pointed out that you need an enabling environment, rule of law, control of corruption, and, uh, and good uh, um, strategic alignment and vision, and a strong government lead. So um, I guess my question is, could be, uh, when you don't have that sort of uh, sufficient enabling environment, what do you do? What can the DFIs do um, to, to support uh, good infrastructure investments? So let me move on to next to Diwakar. You've already uh, you know, gave one of the opening speeches, but would you like to add to um, the discussions? I think uh, the issues are really pretty much on the table. <clears throat> Edwin used a great slide uh, to segment the challenges in infrastructure in four buckets. And Morag has presented a very detailed overview of the DFI angle on how you know, the problems we have or what we should be doing. At the end of the day, the good thing about infrastructure is that it is real, unlike a equity capital market, which is more on perception. So what I, f I always say, and it's particularly true for developing uh, economies, you will eventually not lose money in infrastructure. It's like real estate. <laughs> the question is, you don't get it so badly wrong at certain basic things. So let me try to take this discussion along with a few examples. We had financed a renewable solar power project which used concentrated solar power technology. Now, from all accounts, apparently the technology itself is less than successful. There are three or four implementations. They haven't worked. So the plant works at 20% or 22% of its rated expected capacity. But this is a risk of technology, and I think if we are innovating, uh, we can live with that risk. It happens once in a 100 or, or, or less times. Then you have a hydropower project where there has been a major structural failure. A tunnel has collapsed. Did we, uh, you know, there's no point in introspecting to hold somebody accountable or a portion blame. These things also happen. If you've done due diligence on the contractor, everything was fine. Once in a while, things go wrong. and We'll figure out a way of doing a cost overrun, bringing it back on track, giving a longer concession, paying it over a longer period of time. But then this project was supposed to be exporting power and the export market has collapsed. So what do we do with this project now? Uh, suddenly you find that there are external factors which were not factored in, which were not expected, but they've happened. So now, then we move to the renewable space over a period of time, 15 years. Renewable power, when it came in mainstream on the grid, was costing you about anywhere between 25 and 35 cents per unit. And now as technology costs have fallen, it's come down to three or four cents. Now we have utilities who are buying the power. They have PPAs. And many of them are government entities. And there is a temptation on the part of some of them to say, why should I be renewing that contract? Or why should I not force that client to renegotiate? Because today I am getting power at one tenth. So now there is a regulatory issue where a government or a government entity is pushing a client out of business for no fault of his. He was an early mover. He came in at a higher price point because of the technology being that costly. How do you take care of this risk? On the other side, you have urban services, water, sanitation, waste water, great demand, solid waste. We know we need to do work on this as of yesterday. But the revenue streams are very volatile, unstable. We don't know whether from the retail, whether non-revenue water can be converted to revenue, whether it will be a very big political challenge for the establishment to start charging for that water. So where does the revenue come from? And governments don't have the wherewithal mostly in the developing world uh, or deep pockets to be able to subvent this activity till it becomes mainstream over 10 or 15 years. So there is a plethora of challenges. And then of course we've talked about land, uh, you know, land is the single biggest stumbling block. If you look at the road sector in India, I come from India and I happen to know India uh, uh, better, so I'll use examples from India. 
uh, it was a great model for public-private partnerships. Fantastic. It all went very well. You had annuity payments. Then at some point of time, the government said the sector is developed and I don't think we need annuity payments. Let's just go for the regular revenue risk to be on the, on the uh, uh, promoter of the project. And eventually, in a completely unrelated manner, the nation went into a regulatory, uh, what should you say, oh, uh, no, overreach in terms of oversight. A couple of things went wrong and there was accountability issues. The Central Vigilance Commission or the CBI got into it. And then decision making got paralyzed. So today the twin balance sheet problem in India is a problem where decision making is not happening. Because if I am going to be faulted for a decision which I took six years ago in good faith and it's gone wrong for no fault of mine, but my integrity and competence is being called into question, I would much rather not take a decision. And that is a very big part of problems in these projects. They languish because the person taking a decision is not the owner, he is a civil servant yeah. or a bureaucrat. And for him, protecting himself is as important as taking a good decision. And it's a management tenet that if there is a conflict between a personal interest and the organizational interest, the personal interest is likely to trump. So I think those are the issues on governance that come in. How do we tackle them? So let's take an ex exception. I think if you look for one exception, which has overcome all this, China has got it right. China has leapfrogged in 20 years, literally to this, you know, almost a developed status, great infrastructure. So what are the things with China? A, they had a perspective. They had, a very, they had the capability and they invested in having a proper plan for whatever sector was to be developed. Whether it was right or wrong, whether they went in for coal, it's a different matter. But they needed energy, they had a plan how they will do it. The second and very big one was that the government had deep pockets. They could provide the money, they could, they could uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an economy which has got a, no foreign exchange problems, it's got a great uh, forex surplus, it has got a government which is liquid and solvent, they didn't have a problem with the resources. The third thing was that they had no problem on execution. They have not only built execution capacity, all the approvals will come. If a thing has to be done, it has to be done. And there is no, nothing which will really impede the progress of a project because regulatory approvals are missing. So those were the three. And the fourth thing is, of course, their execution is great. So in, you know, if, if, if you can put up 70,000 megawatts of power in 18 months, that says something about the scale at which you can execute. So those are the four things that have seen them go where they are. And that gives us some sense on which way we should go. And I think that's where DFIs have the role of advocacy and evangelism. We need to build capacity of governments to look at the big picture and to develop enabling frameworks where ultimately where will capital flow? At the end of the day, if I have got $100 in my pocket, I'll put them only where I feel they are safe. And it's about creating that perception or feeling of safety. That safety comes from taking away uncertainty the anxiety of uncertainty. And therefore, you need regulatory mechanisms which are delinked from the political process because governments will change and projects will take longer than one government. How do you ensure that this carries on to the next government? So I'll give you a very good example on the positive side, again, in the Indian context. When the current government came in power in 2014, there was a big debate on whether the national ID system should be scrapped or whether it should be promoted further. Because the national ID system somehow was tagged as a name to an earlier government. And I remember that there was this very major debate on whether the Aadhaar should be promoted or whether it should be scrapped and something called a national population register should be brought in. I think it is to the credit of this government that they had the vision to feel that this was in the right direction. It didn't matter whether politically some of this went to the credit of somebody else. Today, Aadhaar has got a billion enrollments, and over the last three months in India, the United Unified Payment Interface payments exceed the, the transactions on debit plus credit cards combined. So that is the kind of thing, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a decision which you take for the longer good, but it, in the short term, you may have a downside to it. That is the, I think, and to some extent, MDBs and DFIs have the role to be sensitizing and educating governments 
on that. So I think those are the broad rubrics, provide stability, provide transparency, plug corruption, and therefore build confidence among investors. There's so much money around, you know, $100 trillion or something, long money. What flows into Asia is $80 billion, it's 0.1% of the pool. So it's just because you are not perceived as a good enough risk. Forex is a very important thing. We have this continuous problem about local currency funding. And in the central western countries, um, uh, particularly over the last seven or eight years, currency devaluation has made a lot of projects unviable. It's, it's, a, it's a major problem. Now, there is no quick fix to it. You need to develop capital markets. You need to develop bond markets. But again, the appetite of an offshore saving to get into that country in that currency will depend on the diaspora of that currency. Opportunities exist, but that they need to be cultivated and nurtured. That, that's Great. It. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, what I picked up, uh, I, I actually worked on China before I joined the Curry office. I was very interested to hear your take on China. You started off by describing how difficult it is, the way I interpret what you were saying, how difficult it is, challenging it is to allocate risk between the public and private sector, especially when revenue streams are uncertain, et cetera. One of the challenges, and, and the challenges that government officials are under in certain contexts of making decisions that they may be accountable for when it's difficult to sort of predict how the cost structure will change, how markets will change. And what I understood from what you were saying about China was these issues China have done quite well in addressing, um, in allocating risk. Um, of course, in China, it's a, it's a very sort of uh, in somewhat unique environment as well. A lot of their PPPs are, uh, you know, the, the private partner are SOEs, in fact. So allocation is within <laughs> the government in some That's sense. Right. But I think maybe there's, there's more that we can learn about China and, uh, and their success in building up their infrastructure. And there's no denying they've been quite successful in that. So. Uh, so very, uh, very, uh, I think, nice uh, perspective on that. Let me finish off again, uh, last but not least, Arash, uh, since you're coming from the private sector, can I ask you to, based on what you've heard so far, are you more optimistic, less optimistic about the future of private investments in infrastructure? Uh, do you go away with, uh, with some questions in your mind? Would you like to share those questions with us? Thank you. Sure, Th th thanks for that. Look, I, I, I think, uh, just, just to give everyone a bit of an introduction and, and, and background, obviously sit on the other end of the spectrum in terms of uh, you know, a project. So you've got, the, uh, you've got the government on one side developing projects, then you've got the DFIs trying to help them, and then, then you come to the private sector, which is actually looking for opportunities to invest in those projects. So our role is to, uh, what we do at Macquarie, we do two, two main things. One is invest our own money in projects, and two is raise private sector money, both banks and investors, for, for, for these infrastructure projects. Um, look, in, in terms of uh, do, do I feel encouraged, I, I think, you know, short answer is yes. Um, you know, the three things that we typically look for in a, in a project, um, the first one is a, a, a good legal framework. So when it comes to a project, you know, are, are we confident that that legal framework works? Um, you know, the contracts you're signing will be upheld in, in, in the courts. Um, you know, are you confident that the, the, the counterparty you're dealing with, uh, you know, is, is, is in the right environment? So that, that's the first one. The second one is government, and, and that, that's obviously a pretty broad topic. Um, but with government, um, you know, the first thing is just making sure that there's a clear policy framework um, and direction. So what, what makes it difficult for private sector investors is when a government policy changes every couple of years. Mm. So it's kind of knowing that, you know, if, if you're going to go down the track of we want to do infrastructure projects, you know, kind of planning that and, and sticking to that. And I think, Mr. Gupta, you mentioned that earlier. You know, what China's done well is, is that forward planning. Um, so planning and, and sticking to a policy. Um, and the second one is uh, with government is, is just their experience and, and making sure that that they get the projects right. You know, what really damages a market and a government is, uh, is, is, is cancelled projects. So what, what happens is, you know, you go through a process, we spend money, you know, developing, uh, reviewing, 
uh, analyzing projects and then a government cancels it two years down the track and we've not only wasted time, we've also wasted money, um, it makes it difficult for, uh, for the private sector to take uh, investments in those countries seriously. Um, so first one was, was a proper legal framework, second one was a, uh, uh, the government uh, process. The third one is, uh, is and, and this kind of comes after the first two are in place, is, is it a good project? So, you know, unless those two things are in place, the third question we ask is, you know, is this a good project? Is there a demand for this infrastructure? Is there, uh, uh, you know, is, is there a need in the community? Um, is this actually physically going to work? Uh, you know, if it's a renewable project, are, are the conditions right? Is there the right wind speed, the right uh, uh, amount of uh, solar? Um, so th they're the things that we look for. And kind of tying it all together, what is important is, is momentum and, and, and getting, getting projects right. So, um, you know, a good project means that there'll be a second good project and a third good project and you'll see investors flock to those countries and, and, and those opportunities. So, you know, um, I think we, we, we heard earlier about an opportunity in Georgia. You know, if that went well and then a second one goes well, you know, next thing you know is we'll have investors calling us saying we want to do deals in Georgia. What would really harm a project is something not going well. So one project fails and a second one fails in the same place and it's going to be very, very hard to actually do another one. And, you know, you're setting yourself back a few years before you're there again. So, um, yeah, so, so from our side, I, I, I'm definitely encouraged. You know, I think, uh, Martin, you mentioned earlier that there's three to four trillion dollars a year that's required for, for infrastructure globally. Um, you know, at the moment, there's about $170 billion of infrastructure dry powder sitting there. So that's available capital. So you've got three to four trillion per annum needed. You've got $175 billion that's ready to go. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a question of how do you make those things line up? And it's, it's possible, you know, we've, we've obviously seen it happen all around the world. Um, and, and yeah, we, we're definitely uh, optimistic about what, uh, what's happening. Okay, so in conclusion, you're optimistic. So that's a <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> but you cited the need for clear policy framework and direction and for this to be sustained. I think that's the key thing since a lot of these projects require uh, sustained investments from the private sector. <clears throat> and you noted that track records are extremely important. If there are canceled projects or a series of projects that have failed, that just makes it very difficult for uh, private sector to consider the uh, consider the country to be, I guess, a safe uh, and reliable investment uh, location. Okay, so thank you, everyone. We've gone through all the panels. We've heard their views uh, and their thoughts and their questions. I'd like to. I think we have about 15 minutes left. I'd like to open the floor to Q and A. Uh, we have mics, uh, and uh, please uh, step up to the mics with. Any questions, comments, suggestions you may have? If you want to address it to specific panel members, feel free to do that. If you want to address it broadly to the whole panel, that's okay as well. Um, yes, there, there's a mic. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sharad Sumani from KPMG, based in Singapore. Uh, thank you for very insightful thoughts. Uh, it's a very, um, very comprehensive discussion. Uh, I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, MDBs and uh, multilateral uh, institutional investors have been playing a very, very important role, specifically in the emerging markets in terms of capacity development, um, transparency, improvement kind of stuff. Bulk of the focus, I think, though, is primarily on um, greenfield projects. My question to the panel is, uh, what is the possibility of focusing on existing infrastructure projects and getting the private sector management and technology and best practices to improve the efficiency and productivity of the infrastructure assets. Because bulk of the infrastructure assets in the emerging markets owned by public sector, uh, not necessarily opti uh, operating at optimal levels. And I know the privatization is a wrong word in most of the developing countries, but as Australia is doing recycling of capital, I believe that that may be a good idea for developing investor confidence of working with government in the uh, infrastructure sector. So welcome thoughts, thanks. Why don't we take a few more questions? Can I? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. My name is Peter Matthews. I'm with COST, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. I'm also the international chair of the C20 Infrastructure Working Group. Uh, really interesting discussion. Thank you to all the panelists. My particular interest is in uh, low-income countries and fragile and conflict-affected states. There's been a real emphasis on mobilizing private and institutional investment. But at the moment, um, it makes up a very small proportion of the investment in low-income countries, less than 1%, I suspect. How realistic is it that you can mobilize private and institutional investment to meet the financing gap in low-income and fragile and conflict-affected states? Thank you. Let me take maybe one more question, but let me just add the, the World Bank has a, a fragile and violence conflict uh, state division or department, and the, the bank office here, which I head, the World Bank Group office, also has a team on this. So uh, I'd li I, I'm very interested in your question as well and how we can support infrastructure investments in, in these sort of uh, much more challenging environments. But, can I ask maybe one more question? So we have three questions to address. Yeah. Okay, one more. Thank you, uh, Tim Meany from Asian Development Bank. Uh, again, thanks to the panel for uh, a very illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, my question would be in relation to the, the impact of governance to assist project developers to move from the, the type of ad hoc project development scale that we've seen at present to a much more sort of scalable approach to project development as we've mm -hmm. seen through PPP programs, whether or not this is for Greenfield or as Sherrod mentioned, for uh, a process of uh, rehabilitation of existing infrastructure uh, to, to I mean, particularly using technology uh, to render it uh, far more efficient than it uh, currently performs. Okay, so let's Ask the panel members, uh, let me just uh, summarize. We had three sets of questions. One was, how can we, especially MDBs, support existing projects to improve their efficiency and uh, operations as opposed to greenfield projects? Second was, you know, how likely it I is it to uh, mobilize and how can we support uh, in infrastructure investments in fragile states and conflict states? And third, how can we have a more scalable uh, approach to project development, if, if I understood that correctly? Um, who wants to start off from the panel members on any of those questions? Feel free. Okay, Martin? Yeah, thank you for, for the very good question. I would like to take on, uh, on, on two of them uh, for team. I'm not sure that I will have a, a, a good answer on uh, uh, scalable uh, projects. Uh, but first, on the point by, by uh, Shirad on um, existing projects, I, I think that's an area with great potential. If you think of um, the fact that, uh, as, as I tried to say in, in my intervention, that the sharing of the risk is quite complex and that we have a lot of uncertainty, as I said, because we don't know whether the government will really be able to deliver on its part because there may be changes as... Uh, uh, um, we saw in the case of India in the, in the explanation of the panel where all of a sudden uh, something that seemed on track gets into, into, into obstacles. But once the project is up and running, part of the risk has been dissipated. So you have really good information. And one thing we are uh, now doing in the case of India at the World Bank is projects that have a steady flow now of, of revenue can be of interest for investors that are looking for relatively high return but uh, still manageable risk, like pension funds from advanced economies. And for us, uh, helping governments transfer uh, what, what is for now a liability with the, the World Bank or other uh, uh, investors and, 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 and agencies. Uh, to uh, one with the private sector is a way to free resources up for further investment. So I, I would say that's uh, on, on, the, um, on the existing project. On, on Peter's question on, em, on emerging, uh, on um, low-income countries, especially fragile countries, as Hun said, uh, that's uh, really a very challenging uh, frontier. My impression is that um, there is not there investments that will be very difficult in fragile env environments with, uh, with the private sector, but there are some 
that have high potential. And I would say there are two areas in which I think we are relatively successful. Uh, one is uh, on mobile phone uh, solutions, because that works relatively well, even in very difficult environments, and it helps people conduct business, even when formal business do not operate through, through mobile phones. So that we are seeing even in cases like Afghanistan uh, success. Uh, the other is like uh, um, mining developments or extractive, because there you have players that know how to operate even in very, very uh, challenging environments. But I think one has to be very selective on the sectors uh, we get in. Thank you. Anybody else want to add? Yeah, I could. Um, I'll just add on a focus on brownfield as well as greenfield. Um, I'd, I'd agree this is, this is important and we must sort of get away from some countries which have a bit of a sort of model of sort of build, let it deteriorate and then rebuild um, to have much more of this focus on, on operation and maintenance. Um, and although in a lot of development countries there's a big focus on greenfield, obviously, um, more and more there will be this issue to address in brownfield. And I think also in the developed countries, you know, we are now reaching that stage where a lot of the infrastructure which was put in, you know, post the Second World War is getting towards the end of its days. So I think this focus on, on brownfield is, is very timely, in fact, really quite urgent. Um, I'm looking forward to the later discussions on last mile infrastructure and how we work in, in sort of fragile and conflict affected states. Um, I think there are areas of work which private sector investment will be possible and there'll be areas where it won't be. Um, it will have to be quite selective um, and the impact of governance. I mean, that's, that's massive. You sort of asked the question at the end of my speech, you know, what what do you do when those sort of government players aren't there to, to be supporting? <coughs> and quite frankly, I do think the answer is you get less effective outcomes. Diwaka, you wanted to come in? Yeah, as a, to Sharad's question, you know, the, the problem is that if you need to do 1.7 trillion a year, that's the gap. Resources are comparatively limited. Then where do you channelize them? Do you really go for rebuilding something uh, which is, uh, you know, giving some trouble, or whether you go for something new, which is state-of-the-art, efficient. So that trade-off is always there. But to your point, it's, a, it's, you know, at least for the Asian Development Bank, we do engage with SOEs for SOE reform. It may not be project-related, but uh, certainly getting the SOEs to perform better, to, be, to privatize, to get market practices, to be more transparent, and that will help them in the longer term. There are a couple of great opportunities that exist today, so to, to the point that Morag just made. If you go to all the Central Asian countries, their power generation and irrigation setups, they are all Soviet era, and they are either inefficient or inadequate. Now there, I think it's the matter of convincing governments to put in that, because now what is happening is that it is working, but it's working, you know, it's, it's producing power at 11 cents or 15 cents you could get it down to four cents. But there is no shortage of power. So how do you get the governments to realize that this is an upgrade you need to do? It's a great example because eventually, renewable power has the big problem, except for hydro or geothermal, that you need base load support. In other words, tomorrow if the world goes to a situation where you can get 60% renewable power, then you will still need 80% power generating capacity which will work at 20% base load. So if you have plants which are obsolete and aging, that's the ideal platform where you can put in a lot of renewable energy and have these plants just fill in for base load while they get phased out and you get something else. But it's a long, it's a long term uh, effort to convince the governments to get a consensus around that kind of approach and do it again on a holistic country-wide, sector-wide basis. On uh, uh, low-income countries, uh, it's, it's a major problem. And uh, therefore, what we do is to give a combination of grants, concessional money, and facilities. Very recently, in the private sector side, for the Pacifics, which are our small island development states, 14, 15 of them, we've put up a renewable energy uh, enhanced credit enhancement facility. 
The problem with the smaller states is that you will not get scale that MDBs feel is viable. Mm -hmm. With the due diligence and everything that you need to do, safeguards, environmental uh, measures, if it's a $5 million deal, it's not worth, worth the while of, of the bank to do it on a commercial basis. Mm -hmm. You need 50 million and it's hard to get 50 million in the Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is a utility which comes in to give a huge amount of credit enhancement to let's say a five megawatt inv investment in solar power. And we are very hopeful that things, um, a credit enhancement measures of this kind will kickstart some investment in the smaller countries. On the uh, impact of governance on piecemeal versus sector, I think we've already discussed it's again a longer term, if that's how it should be. But we again need governments to engage mm -hmm. and buy in. We need also to figure out that there will be regulatory mechanisms which will carry over one government to the other without a discontinuity. Mm -hmm. Now we have less than five minutes. I just want to check, are there, because we can go on with these questions. Uh, and I think Edwin wanted to, do you want to come in? Well, right. just very briefly yeah. with response to Tim's question, I think this reveals a real lack in getting the basics right. Uh, so we're about to release a, a, a report on Southeast Asia with the ADB called Government at a Glance. And in that, we ask, uh, in Southeast, for the 10 ASEAN countries, how many of them have PPP units to really be able to conduct this analysis? Mm. Four out of the 10 have it in the Central Ministry of Finance. Only two out of the 10 have it in the line ministries. So there's a real lack of capability to be able to uh, conduct these analyses. When we ask them, are you able to... Uh, compare the cost of PPP projects versus traditional infrastructure procurements, 60% of them say we don't have the data, we don't have the information to be able to conduct that kind of analysis. So there, there's kind of steering in the dark. Where they do conduct the analysis, it's mainly on costs. So they're not able to conduct the analysis on impact, on timeliness, uh, and on transaction costs. So we don't have the information we need. A second issue is beyond the analysis, are we able to aggregate the information to be able to learn from it? So when we ask the question, is there a central systematic collection of information on the financial and non-financial performance of infrastructure, only the Philippines says that they do that. So there's this real issue of, if you want to go from ad hoc to scalable, you have to be able to learn. And it goes back to the, the, the point from the private sector. If you're able to learn from those projects, then you can build the momentum. But if you're not able to learn, then you're stuck sort of case by case basis. I wish we could say that the OECD is doing better, <laughs> but uh, less than a quarter of OECD countries report that they're doing the same thing. So this is really a shared challenge. Yeah. So maybe it's not simply a capacity issue then. If OECD advanced countries are sort of lacking in that, it's recognition of the need to do this maybe, the political issues. Uh, the regulatory issues. Regulatory so issues. with our civil services, uh, and the pay scales, they're not able to attract the type of skills and experience that they mm. need to be able to make these decisions. Mm. You know, someone that's get, earning a six-figure salary or more, do they really want to come into the public sector to be able to do the same type of work with even more risks? And I think uh, VP Gupta pointed this out. You know, this is part of the paralysis. Mm. Why should they take the risk uh, when the downside is so huge? Okay. Let me... Finish up by asking, there's uh, either uh, Taekwon or Aresh. Do you want to comment on any of these issues? Investing in uh, fragile states is a no-go as far as your firm is concerned because of the difficulties, what, what sort of experience you have. You worked on Pakistan projects. That's obviously a, you know, a, yeah. a difficult environment. Yeah. Taekwon, you want to start? Yeah, Pakistan is the most difficult thing in Pakistan. The land acquisition is the most difficult thing to do. Because there is no documentation of the land. The land is called a tree, 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 또 어, 그 예를 들어 아버지가 돌아가셨을 때 어머니에게 유산 그 주어지는 유산 부분 또 아들에게는 뭐몇 퍼센트 이런 것들이 다 되기 때문에 이제 저희가 프로젝트를 할때 사실 뭐 기도를 한게 제발 이 지금 현재 토지 소유자들이 돌아가시지 않도록 왜냐면 그분이 또 돌아가시게 되면 또 토지 소유권이 또 바뀌고 그 랜드 에퀴션을 다시 프로세스를 밟아야 되는데 그런 상황까지 있었거든요. 그래서 이거 보험을 들어줄까도 고민도 많이 해보고 그랬었는데 그만큼 어, 이 MDB에서 인프라 개도국 인프라 사업을 
이제 나중에 가버넌스라든가 레귤레이토리 뭐 프레임을 만드실 때 그런 토지 랜드 액시션을 얼마만큼 민간 사업 투자자들이 컴포터블하게 만들어 줄 것인가 여기에 많은 투자하고 연구가 있어야 될것 같습니다. 네, 이상. Arash, do you want to come in with the last comment on any of these issues? Scalable projects, fragile state investments, uh, you know, helping with operations as opposed to greenfield investments. Yeah, yeah look, I mean, I, I can touch on a, a couple of those things. I think on, on fragile countries, obviously that's challenging for private sector. Um, you know, if you, if you kind of go slightly um, less fragile economies, you know, the things that that will support and help private sector get into those markets is uh, uh, one is local finance. So, so you know, not relying on, on foreign finance, but helping, you know, local, whether it's pension funds or banks or investors uh, use their capital supporting their own economy. Um, and, and two is, you know, getting support from organizations like the World Bank and ABB to, to really uh, help, I guess, finance those projects. So it, look, it is, it is challenging, obviously, for private sector, but um, you know, th there are solutions. And, and you know, I think, uh, Martin, you mentioned earlier that you know, doing things like telephone towers may, may be an easier bite for, for private sector rather than going for, a, 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 for a, something like an airport or, or, or a highway. Um, so I think there are solutions. You know, on, on, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, I think, Tim, you asked about scalability. You know, wh what, is, what is important is that just more communication between um, all the different stakeholders. You know, I think if you've got lots of different countries doing their own programs, it's really hard to understand and get across everything. To, to the extent that, you know, you've got some lessons learned, some, some uh, frameworks that are replicated, uh, and, and maybe even collaboration so that, you know, you have a group of countries that have a similar, whether it's a renewable scheme, it gives people confidence that, you know, that that's where I want to go and I'm not wasting my time with one project, but I've actually got opportunity to do, you know, 15 projects. So I think, yeah, to get scalability to work, you do need a lot more cooperation and just uh, people talk to each other. All right. Can we give a round of applause to the panel members? Thank you very much. We've had a good discussion. Let me hand it over to Min Jae for the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a, a, an active and very engaging discussions uh, from the panel um, and, and to the moderator, Mr. So.